Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday morning, Anchor Church. And happy first weekend of fall, right? It's our first, I can't believe it. So I know a lot of you love this time of year, right? The, the Burr months, BJ, you do. October, November, December. <laughs> They're too cold for me, but I like to celebrate um, with the food. It's good. So I did bring some of my favorite candy, and it's Jim Stokes' favorite candy. He'll be here shortly. A lot of candy corn, so you can grab the candy corn. You can eat that. Just keep quiet on the wrappers. You're good. So, and there are sermon notes. And the song sheets this morning have an extra insert. That's going to be our last song because I, I couldn't decide. We're singing five songs. So a lot of singing. So the sermon title is To Sleep in the Back Seat. And you'll see Barbie and Ken are in their car there. And they have their babies in the back. So that's me and Rick, actually. No, not the babies. <laughs> Not the babies. <laughs> it's, it, shh, okay. Anyway. So, it, you know, one of the reasons why I love Sunday mornings is that we get to be together and then we can also refocus on what we should be thinking about. We come back to the truth because we are like dogs, you know, like squirrel, and we forget. So that's why we come. So I love Isaiah 26 says this about our minds. You will keep in perfect peace, Lord, those whose minds are stayed on you, because we trust in you, so there can be calm in the chaos. So let's sing about God's peaceful presence in our lives this morning.
downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you as deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me, but they are yours, Lord, and you are in them.
Lord, because of who you are. You are faithful, you are trustworthy, you are just, and you are good, and you are patient, and you are always right here with us, and you are love. We can have peace in the storms, and we can have calmness in the chaos because of you. For you know, you've been here, you, you see this world is stress-filled and crazy, and there's no security, and everything seems to be broken and not working. But, and that's true, because that's why you had to come, and that's why you had to die. But we rejoice this morning, Father, in who you are, and we give thanks for your constant grace and your abiding love. For in you, in you alone, we find peace. We pray, Lord, this morning that your peace will rule in our hearts in every day. Amen. All right, well, say good morning to your neighbor and have some water and candy corn. Hey, they got good candy corn. Jim's candy corn. I, I got you. Yeah. Okay, if you could find a seat, we're going to move along here. Let me just... Uh, so... Um, want to keep praying for uh, Mary Stubbs' dad as she continues her treatments for the brain cancer and for Susie Duell as she recovers uh, from surgery and also she's dealing with uh, just a lot of issues for her. So pray for her. And uh, so uh, I just want to let you know that I'm doing well after my surgery a week and a half ago. And um, as of today, uh, I am done with uh, my treatments for uh, after 10 months. So, you hoo At least that's the plan. You know, the funny thing is when you get involved with the medical community, it's like there's a lot of things that you say, oh, this is going to happen. And then it's like, oh, actually, we got to change that. But hopefully, prayerfully, uh, I'm, I should be done. And so we're very thankful to the Lord for that, getting us through that, getting me through that. So let's pray for just a moment. Again, Father, we thank you for this glorious day. We do continue to pray for Mary Stepsdad and for Susie Duell and uh, their treatments. And I, Lord, I really do thank you that um, as of now, I'm supposedly done, and that's really encouraging and good news. So we thank you for that. Lord, most of all, we thank you that in the midst of all these things, we know that life holds lots of um, unpleasant surprises for all of us from time to time. In the midst of it, we have a rock that we just sang about, that you are our rock, and you are the source of refuge and peace for us, and we praise you for that. We pray that you'll remind us of that and center our hearts in that today as we look at your word, and we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what is the best present you've ever been given? Uh, in the last month, Lori and I celebrated our anniversary, our wedding anniversary, and leading up to it, I felt this pressure building up. And the pressure, the, none of it comes from Lori. There's no pressure from Lori whatsoever, but I have this internal pressure. I, I love Lori so much that I want her to know how much I love her, and so I always want to give her a 
present that will be the best present she's ever received. But you know, we've been married 44 years. And every year we have birthday, we have Christmas, we have anniversary. And so that's uh, three present giving times every year. You multiply that by 44, that's 132. After a while, it's like it's hard to keep topping anything, you know. And so uh, I felt this, I want to give her something and she's just going to love and blow her away. Uh, And it's just not possible to keep always being the best unless you start with the bar awfully low, you know. Um, So I was pretty sure that the lawn edger and the egg beater we recently got her wasn't going to be it. But fortunately, um, fortunately I was able to come up with a gift that delighted her. And she was very happy with that. That That was great. But, you know, there is a gift that she really wants that I can't give her. Um, And I know she wants this, not just because she tells me this, but because every human being wants it. There's something that writer Frederick Buechner said is the present that all of us hope for above all others. He said we go through life and it's like we're opening presents on Christmas Day. Life brings these gifts to us and we open them and we're hoping for this one present And we get these gifts, and many of them are wonderful, and they're delightful, but they're not the one we want above all else. Uh, What is that gift? Well, okay, it's not a Red Ryder range rifle with this compass in the stock and this thing that tells time that Ralphie wanted, you know, in the movie. Um, This rare, precious gift is peace. Buechner said every human being longs for peace. And the sad part about it is peace among us, inner peace, true peace, is about as rare as unicorns. Basically, you don't find it. Um, 18th century British writer Henry Fielding said, I am content, and that is a blessing greater than riches. And to he whom that is given, he needs ask no more. If you're content, if you're at peace, he says, that's the greatest riches, and you need ask for nothing else. But as I said, uh, that gift of peace is very rare. I read a quote from one person who said that peace is our natural state. Nothing could be more further from the truth than that. That is not true. Um, in his book, Secrets of the Dark, Buechner said that actually emptiness and unease is a part of the inner world of all of us. And it's interesting that research has shown that in quiet moments, that is where all of us tend to go towards unease and disquiet. Um, Writer Fran Lebowitz said, there is no such thing as inner peace. There's only nervousness and death. Wouldn't want to be her, but you know, she's saying this is the way life is. There's a psychologist and professor at the Claremont Graduate School. His name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He's got a real long name. Um, But he says entropy is the normal state of consciousness. In other words, disorder, disquiet, that's normal for us human beings. And so that being the case, that raises the question, if we all want peace and we all don't have peace, how do we get it? Humorist Dave, uh, Dave Barry said, my therapist told me the way to achieve inner peace is to finish what I start. So today... I have finished two bags of M&M's and a chocolate cake, and I feel better already. (laughs) So maybe not the best uh, solution for us. So here's what we start with. All of us human beings want peace, and we want it badly, and uh, we don't have it. So today we're going to continue. As we're studying the book of John, we come to John chapter 14. This is the night before Jesus is going to be arrested, and the next day he's going to be executed. He knows it. Um, And in John 14, he's in the midst of having a long discussion with his followers. And here's what he says in the first two verses. We're just going to look at two verses. He says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? So there's a premise there. And the premise is that Jesus wants his followers to have peace. Says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Be at peace. Be calm. Um, now, in ancient Greek, the Greek language that John wrote in, uh, there were actually two ways to state a negative command when he says, don't do this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. 
there were two ways to state that. One meant uh, don't start being troubled. Don't do that. Don't begin doing that. The other is uh, stop doing what you're already doing. And it's that form that John has Jesus using here. In other words, when he says don't let your hearts be troubled, it's because their hearts already were. He's saying don't be troubled. Be at peace. Be calm. Uh, And it's easy to understand why Jesus' followers' hearts might have been seriously troubled and lacking in peace. Um, The situation that Jesus and his followers were in at this point was really tense. And a few chapters earlier in John 11, we saw that uh, when Jesus had proposed, they'd been outside the city of Jerusalem. When Jesus proposed to go back to the Jerusalem area, which was to deal with Lazarus, who was sick and eventually died, Um, And Jesus proposed to go back there. Thomas said, well, let's go with him that we may die with him. The the situation they understood was a life or death situation. They uh, They fully understood that things had gotten so bad that Jesus' life was in jeopardy. And the problem for them, not only is that they're concerned about Jesus, but they're thinking, well, if the leaders go after Jesus and they want to stomp out anything having to do with Jesus... They might come after us as well. So our lives are at risk here. So we got that as the background. And then in the chapter four, before 14, the context leading right up to this in John 13, 33, Jesus has said, I will be with you only a little longer and you will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I'm going, you can't come. So here are these guys that have given up really much of their lives for the last couple of years to follow Jesus. They've dedicated themselves to him, and they think he's the Messiah. And their image of the Messiah is he's going to conquer Rome, he's going to become the king of the world, and they're going to be ruling with him. And now Jesus says, well, I'm not going to be with you much longer. I'm about to go away, and you can't come. Wait. What happened to Messiah? What, what happened to the big movement? What happened to the big kingdom that we're, we're going to start here? Um, and so they're distraught about that. And then right at the end of chapter 13, Jesus had turned to Peter after Peter had said, well, no matter what happens, I will never give up following you. I will go to the death for you. And Jesus told him, well, Peter, before this night is over, you're going to deny me three times. And now, the next thing Jesus says is, don't let your hearts be troubled. Wait, we're in a life or death situation. Now you're saying that the plan that we thought, with your Messiah and you're going to rule, that's going away and we're going to be left with nothing. And furthermore, one of us is going to betray you and Peter is going to deny you. Don't let your heart be troubled? I'm sure at that point they're saying, I hate to tell you this, Jesus, but that train left the station a while back, you know. Too late. They are troubled. Big trouble. Jesus is saying, stop being upset. Don't worry. Calm down. Be at peace. That's Jesus' wills, not just for those guys that were there in that room, but for all of his followers. Think back to the prophecies about the coming Messiah. Way back to Isaiah, 800 years before Jesus came. One of his most famous prophecies we're all familiar with because we hear it at Christmas every year. For unto us a son is born, a child is born, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Jesus is the prince of peace. He comes to bring peace to people, unending peace. Near the end of his teaching on, in this night that we're looking at, John and John 14, just a couple chapters later in John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you, all the stuff he's been telling them, that in me you may have peace peace. That's what I want for you. Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it tells us that one of the results of having the Spirit of Jesus in us is going to be peace. Uh, this is not new. Jesus has actually been saying stuff like this all the way through his ministry. Right early on in the Sermon on the Mount, John 6, uh, verse 25, he had said, Do not worry about your life. Be calm. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink or about your body or what you'll wear. In verse 31, he said again, don't worry about what we'll eat or drink. And then again in verse 34, he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Let that deal with it. Don't stress. Be at peace. So here's the question. You know, you hear that Jesus saying, don't worry. Don't let your heart be troubled. Here's the question. Does it help you when you're really stressing about something and someone says, oh, don't worry about it? Oh, Well, thank you for your sage advice. I feel so much better. It doesn't work, does it? Oh, okay, I'm not going to (sighs) worry. Later on, uh, Paul would write a letter to the Philippians, Philippians 4, 6, and he said, uh, be anxious for nothing. Don't get anxious. Oh, yeah, again. Oh, well, great. Yeah, I'm not going to be anxious about anything. How well does that work? Okay. Yeah, be anxious for nothing. Well, I, you know what? I have a way to do that. Just give me an anesthetic and put me out, and, and I'll go to sleep and won't worry about anything. The problem is I'll wake up. <laughs> you know, um, over the last 10 months, I've had uh, treatments, the immune therapy treatments, every three or four weeks. And every time I go down there to get the treatments, they take my blood pressure. They usually do it two or three times during the four hours I'm there. And it's been interesting that pretty much every time I go, uh, the, the nurses that do it go, wow, your, your blood pressure is really good, you know, because I have low, pretty low blood pressure, you know. The last, second to last time I was there, it was really funny. The, the gal took all my vital signs, and she looks at me, and she goes, why are you even here? Because you know, they're so good. But you know what? My blood pressure isn't always like that. Um, it, was, it was interesting. I also had to have, you know, this biopsy on my thyroid because of, they found something there. And uh, so they were going to do a biopsy, which, you know, the, the doctor told me, oh, well, the hardest part about this is going to be the, you know, we're going to give you some lidocaine. He said, once you get that, that's done. It's, it'll, it's easy. He was lying. It was not true. And I knew it. I talked to my son, Toby, the doctor, and I told him that. And he goes, yeah, I tell him my patients that all the time and not true. <laughs> so I knew that they were going to do a stick a needle in my neck and go into an, you know, an organ, a gland in there. And I thought, this is not going to be fun. And so my blood pressure, which is normally down around 110, it was 140. What was really interesting was my, my pulse rate, which normally is in about the mid-60s, was 90. You know, the funny thing about that was, in that situation, I told myself, well, this is nothing to worry about. This is, I'm, I'm fine. I'm calm. And I thought I was calm. And then they took my blood pressure and my pulse rate, and then my body was saying, no, you're not. You're stressing. You're uptight. Because it's... No way to just go, oh, just be calm. Oh, okay, I'm going to be calm. How do we do that? How do you not worry? How do you not be anxious? Well, the good news is that Jesus didn't just say something as unhelpful as, well, be calm. He told us how to do that in these little verses, if you'll pay attention to it. And here's the first thing he says you need to do. Have confidence in God. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, that's actually kind of a curious translation. That's the New International Version translation of it, and it's kind of an odd translation, and I'll explain why. Um, The Greek language that this was originally written in is a very structured, very specific language. Um, You know, English... I I feel really sorry for people that have to learn English as a second language because it's got to be the most confusing language in the world to learn. Don't you think? I mean, we have words like the the little word R-E-A-D, read, or read. Okay, you see that word on a page. Is it the present tense or is it the past tense? Well, you don't know. 
because they're the same. And what, then it gets really confusing because if somebody's using that word verbally and you hear that and they say red, well, they mean past tense of read or do they mean the color red? They sound the same. This is very confusing. The word L-E-A-D, same thing, lead. Is it lead or is it lead? And is it, when you hear lead, is it the, the metal or is it to go ahead of someone? You know, English. And how about the O-U-G-H words? Uh-huh. Aren't, you know, consider, consider this sentence. I thought I'd done enough, but it was tough to be thorough and think it all through. <laughs> thought about that, you know, O-U-G-H, all of those O-U-G-H words. Uh, if English were consistent and O-U-G-H was pronounced always uff, like in enough, how would that sentence come out? It would be, uh, it would sound like something like, I thuffed I'd done enough, but it was tough to be thorough and uh, uh, think it all thruff. <laughs> English, so confusing. Greek, not so much. Very consistent, very structured language. And in this verse, there is an ambiguity that causes some confusion. Um, Greek, typically, you could actually tell from the spelling of a word, you could know the specific uh, tense, the mood, the person, the number, uh, all of these things. Uh, the voice, all there just in the spelling of a, a verb. But in this case, it's the unusual case in, in Greek where both the indicative mood, which is a statement of fact, like you believe in God, and the imperative mood, which would be a command, believe in God, they have the same form. And so Jesus says, Believe in God, believe in me, are those commands or are they statements? And the NIV did something odd and that both of the words are exactly the same and they translated them differently. They translated the first one as a statement, indicative mood, and the second one as a command, imperative mood. Very odd and I think wrong, personally. I mean, I think that they obviously, the translators of the NIV were thinking that this was what Jesus in, intended to say. Well, you, be, you believe in God, so believe in me too. Yeah, maybe, but I think that's inconsistent. And I think the correct translation, which is found in many trans, New American Standard, the English Standard Version, uh, many others, translate both of them as a command. So Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me. You, you need to trust God, And you need to trust that I know what I'm doing and I have a plan and this is not out of my control. That's what he's telling them. And so the bottom line on being at peace comes down to having confidence in God. Trust in him, trust in Jesus, know what they're doing, they have a plan and they're working the plan and it's a good plan. Um, And I remember when, when our kids were young, they gave us an illustration of this on a number of occasions that, um, happened uh, when we made our ang- annual pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Oh, wait, no, it wasn't the Holy Land. It was the happiest place on earth uh, that we would make an annual trip to Disneyland. We went to Disneyland when our kids were young re- pretty much once a year. And uh, w- because we only went once a year, when we went, we had to make the most of it. So we would get there early in the morning when it was, the park was just opening, and we'd stay till it was almost closing. So we'd be there all day, which meant... When we were driving home at night after having been at Disneyland all day, we had some tired kids in the back seat as we were driving home. And here's what I noticed. They never worried that Dad wouldn't be able to find his way home. Never worried about that. They had confidence in Dad. They never worried that Dad was going to drive them off the freeway and into a cliff or something. They had confidence. They had confidence that mom and dad were going to get them home safely. They didn't have any stress or any worry about that. And so the result of that, because they were so confident, was they were able to just go to sleep in the back seat of the car because they were at peace, because they had confidence in us. And that's what Jesus is telling his followers. Have confidence in God that is what will enable you to have a heart that's not troubled, but is at peace. Confidence in God, confidence in me. You know, 
Um, you think about those guys, they had good reason to be concerned, didn't they? Um, and, you know, in this context, Jesus had talked to them in some vague terms, saying things like, well, he was going away, and where he was going, they, they, they couldn't come, and it, which was, I think, confusing and upsetting to them. And sometimes I read that and I think, why didn't Jesus just spell it all out for them? So here's what's going to happen. Well, the interesting thing about that is he did. Not in this context, but he had done that several times in their lives. In Matthew 16, 21, earlier in his ministry, he had told them, he pulled them aside, and this is what happened. It says, from that day on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. It's interesting that Matthew says he began to tell them that. In other words, he didn't just tell them once, he told them several times. Matthew 17, a chapter later, verse 22 and 23, he said, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19, he says, We are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. We'll hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day he'll be raised to life. Over and over, he told them. You know what their reaction was? It was... I wonder what he means by that. I mean, what do you suppose he's trying to signify by that? He meant just what he said. Why didn't they get that? Why didn't they go, oh, oh, he's going to be rejected by the leaders of our nation. He's going to be handed over to the Romans. They're going to crucify him. He's going to die, and he's going to rise from the dead. He said it multiple times, and they never got it. Why? Why? Well, the reason was they had a different plan. Their minds were so focused on Jesus as the Messiah. Messiah is going to be the king. He's going to rule, and there will be no end to his rule that they couldn't hear what Jesus was telling them. It just bounced right off their heads. Never sunk in. Because they had a plan and Jesus is telling them here, you need to trust that the Father has a plan and I have a plan and you need to trust that it's a good one and it's going to all work out. Peter, yeah, you're going to deny me tonight, but you know what? I don't want you to worry about that because you need to trust that I have a plan and it's all going to be okay. Okay. Here's the thing. We have the same problem they do in a different form. They had a plan for their lives and how that was going to go. And it was such an ironclad plan that what, when Jesus repeatedly told them what was going to happen, they couldn't understand it, they couldn't hear it because they wanted so much to have their plan happen. And we have the same problem. We want our plan for our lives and we hold on to that so tightly that we... We have difficulty understanding that God might have a different plan and accepting that plan. And he says to us the same thing that he said to them, which is, if you want to have peace, what you're going to have to do is let go of that plan and trust in God and what God is doing. You know, when Lori was in high school, she was, like most teenagers, probably, above all else, pursuing popularity. Um, and she succeeded, you know? She was the most popular girl in her school. Um, cool. Um, and so during that period of her life, she had observed, um, which I think this is kind of funny, she had observed the, the wife of the pastor of her church and was not real impressed with her. <laughs> Didn't, and said, the thing I don't ever want to do is be like her. Right, Laurie? Am I too? Yeah, yeah. Did she play the piano in church? Yeah, she did. And Laurie said, the one thing I don't want to do is be the wife of a pastor and play the, church, play the piano in church. <laughs> you know, kind of funny thing happened to Laurie along that road. Um, she got a lot of the things she wanted, the popularity she wanted, and she found it to be empty. And she said, what? 
this doesn't matter. And then she encountered a passage of scripture, a verse from scripture, Romans 8, 32, that says, he, uh, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And she got it. Oh, I can trust God. He's already given his best. He's given his son for me. What else good thing is he going to withhold from me? And so at that point, she decided, I'm going to trust God's life plan for my life. She decided to do that, committed herself to the Lord to follow him. And oh, the irony. <laughs> she ends up a pastor's wife playing the piano and loves it. Something she said, I don't ever want to be. And God says, well, guess what? <laughs> what you're going to do? And she loves it. Because God had a plan, and she just needed to trust the plan and find out it was a good one. It was a good one, being married to me, right? Yeah, oh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I like being married to you. Yeah, good. I like being married to you. So, trust, confidence in God. Hard, because we can't see him. And frankly, sometimes we can't, don't have a clue what his plan is. And for the disciples, sometimes it might... Uh, for us, it might be like the disciples. The plan might be something that we would say, that is the worst thing that could happen. The worst thing that could happen was that Jesus be killed. They no, that can't be the plan. Well, actually, it, it was all along, and it was a good plan, the best plan ever. Might happen with us as well. Confidence in God, first. Second thing that Jesus tells us, this is important, is that we need to know our future is secure. Jesus starts talking about his father's house. He said, my father's house, there are many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when it comes to trusting God, that, and then having peace, that becomes absolutely essential. It's kind of interesting. Um, he says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. The Greek word translated rooms is the plural of uh, the Greek word mone, which actually came from a Greek verb, that meno, which meant to remain. And so the word mone basically meant uh, a place to stay, a place to remain. So, you know, an abode, a dwelling place. Uh, so Jesus in modern slang might be saying, well, I'm going to prepare a crib for you, okay? Um, but there's an interesting bit of uh, history attached to that word, the Greek word there. As the gospel was spread um, and the Roman Empire was becoming more and more uh, monolithic throughout the Western world of that day, um, Latin, Latin began eventually to kind of replace Greek as the, the lingua franca, the trade language. And as that happened, uh, Christians decided, well, we should translate the Greek New Testament into Latin. And so they did. And so when they came to this verse, the Latin word that means the same thing as monet, it was mansiones. And so that's the word that they used there. Well, centuries later, English suddenly came on the, the scene. Well, not suddenly, but came on the scene. And some great Christians decided we should, we should translate the New Testament from Latin into English. And so when they translated Latin into English and they came to this verse and they saw the word mansiones, instead of actually translated it, they just transliterated it, meaning they took the word from Latin right into English and just anglicized it. And so the word became mansions. And that's where people get the idea that, oh, God is building mansions for us in, in heaven. Well, actually, no. That's not what that said. That, that was a misunderstanding that happened through translation. The reality is it says he's just building dwelling places for us that, that Jesus says actually more like suites in the, the big palace. Uh, so that may pop some people's bubbles. I'm really sorry. But here's the point. He's making a place that's suited perfectly for each one of us, that we're going to love that place better than we'd love any mansion on earth. Um. Now, it's interesting that Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And so people have a tendency to go, okay, Jesus is up in heaven. He's like a general contractor. He's building all these places, getting them ready for us. Not what he meant. Um, in his uh, commentary on 
John, excellent scholar D.A. Carson wrote, it is the going itself via the cross and the resurrection that prepares the place for Jesus' disciples. When Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, he did it by dying on the cross and rising from the dead, and that opened the door for us to have a dwelling place, a mansiones, in heaven. And here's the thing. We will never be truly at peace until we know that there is a place for us in eternal life in God's kingdom. Because death stalks all of us. It is horrific. It is implacable. It is terrifying and it is permanent. And it's impossible for us to be at peace until we have some answer for death. Jesus' answer is, yeah, death is not the end for his followers, for you. There's a place for you in God's eternal kingdom, and it is a beautiful place. That's something everyone needs. You know, Larry Ellison, one of the richest men in the world, he owns most of the island of Lanai in Hawaii because he bought it. Um, he contributes $40 million a year to the search for a cure for aging and death. <laughs> Why do you suppose that is? Because he wants an answer. He doesn't want to die. Uh, he said, death makes me angry. It doesn't make any sense to me. How can a person be there and then just vanish? Just not be there. Well, welcome to the reality of life and death. He wants to get away from it. He needs an answer. He'll never be at peace until he gets it. Jesus was providing the answer. There was a... Um, Emperor of China. Actually, it's funny. Lori and I were just read about this guy last night, but I had learned about him earlier. His name is Qin Shi Huang. Uh, don't make me say that a lot. He was a brutal man. I mean, this guy was gnarly. But he was the first emperor of China. Uh, he was the guy that is credited with actually bringing warring. There were just warlords with tribes bringing them all together under one rule and forming the nation of China. He's also the guy that started the Great Wall, started building the Great Wall. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Terracotta Soldiers. He was the guy that built the Terracotta Soldiers. Um, well, something that a lot, often people don't know about him is he became obsessed with immortality. In other words, he didn't want to die. He wanted to live forever. And so he went on this search for elixirs, for solutions that would enable him to stop aging and to live forever, ever. The irony of his situation is that he thought, somehow came upon the idea that mercury was the answer. <laughs> yeah, so he started drinking this elixir with mercury, and that's probably what killed him at the age of 50. Uh, yeah, 50. So, you know, got a long history of people understanding that I need an answer for it death. I'll never be at peace until I have an answer for that. And Jesus said, I'm giving that to you. Lori and I have been on quite a journey over the past nearly a year now. Um, after I was diagnosed with uh, cancer, not anything you ever want to hear, you know, you have to face the possibility that this could end my life. Um, and it could do it quickly, potentially. You know, fortunately for me and for Lori, too, early on the scans revealed it hadn't spread to my organs, so that was good. Uh, but, you know, we met with the oncologist, and he said, well, here are the treatment options. Here's the best treatment option for you. And he said, here are the statistics. Statistics weren't all that encouraging. I mean, it was a good chance, but far from a sure thing. And, you know, you get in a situation like that, and it's like all of a sudden... The idea of the possibility of death, I know I'm going to die. We all know that. All of a sudden, it's staring you right in the face. This could be my reality, and it could be very soon. Really sort of has a tendency to focus your thinking very clearly. Um, you know, once they started the treatments, um, it didn't go well. Um, it, the doctor basically said, well, it was a train wreck when it started. Um, they were able to manage that, and it got better. But, you know, I was sick. 
I was losing weight. I actually got down to uh, where I weighed uh, what I did when I was a sophomore in high school. And it wasn't a good trim kind of, you know, look at me, I'm healthy. It was like, ooh, look at him, he's thick, you know. Um, had a couple of effects on me. One of them was it made me very much focused on, you know what, the only day that I know I have is today, and I'm going to make the most of today. And that's a good thing, and we still think that way. But here's the other thing. It made, it brought in a very sharp focus that having the hope of eternal life is the most important thing in the world, and you will never be at peace until you have it. Jesus said, if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life. There's a place for you in the Father's house. On July 12, 2012, Mary Isom gave in to her two teenage daughters who had been pleading with her. They wanted to go see a movie, The Dark Knight Rises, one of the Batman movies. So they went to see the movie. Half hour into the movie, a young man named James Holmes came into the room, tossed two smoke canisters into the theater, and then began shooting, firing with a rifle at innocent moviegoers. Marie said her, she and her two daughters dove onto the floor, and she covered her younger daughter with her own body. And she said this, In that moment, as the rapid-fire shots continued, I truly thought I was going to die. And I realized I was ready. I have put my faith in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of my soul, and there wasn't the slightest doubt that I would be received into heaven. And she said that moment she was drawn closer into the presence of God than she had ever been. She and her daughters were actually able to escape when the shooter reloaded, but both of her girls have said that experience has made God's presence way more real to them than anything in their lives ever had before. They have hope, and that is crucial for all of us. So we need to remember that. Now, there's one more thing we need to do to have this peace. And that is we need to live in the peace of Jesus. Uh, there's one more element that is critical that actually doesn't show up until verse 20 in John 14. In verse 20, uh, excuse me, in verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. There's that again. And don't be afraid, because I'm going to give you my peace. And that's a powerful thing. His peace isn't like what the world gives. Well, you know, in the world, what kind of peace can the world give us? Well, um, it gives peace basically based on power, control, and circumstances. We get to be at peace when we think we have enough power to control what's going on in our lives so we can get the circumstances we want. That we generally think of as kind of being at peace. But the problem with that is that's no path to peace at all. Because what we're going to find out is, uh, first of all, whatever those circumstances are that we think are the things we want, they're not going to be enough. And secondly, even if we're able to get them, uh, all of a sudden we're going to be stressed over how can I protect it and keep it so that's, because it's going to be threatened continually? And so we're, we have insecurity again. But here's the biggest thing. We don't control very much. We can't control life to go the way we want. You know, Lori and I have had an interesting time this year trying to take a vacation to Hawaii for the last couple of years. It's been very interesting what has happened. Um, we initially planned a trip to Hawaii with, our, with Carissa, our daughter, and her husband, Michael, and their two boys. And we were all going to go, and Lori and I were going to babysit the two boys. We we're going to have this great trip to Hawaii. And then Carissa got pregnant. And Carissa, you know, actually it was just one boy, and then she got pregnant with the second one. So um, the, she had uh, been to Hawaii. She and Michael went to Hawaii when she was pregnant with their first child, with Wesley, and it was miserable. She was sick. She ended up in the hospital in Maui, in Maui. And it was just that she said, I'm never doing that again. So she got pregnant. So we went, oh, well, OK, that, that, that trip's off. You know, we thought, well, well, we'll plan it for a future date. And so we actually were able to work with the airlines to reschedule our trips for, you know, off in the future. And then 
that same year, Lori and I, uh, later in the year, had a trip planned to go to Hawaii to meet Lori's brother, Scott, and his wife, Karen. We were going to be with them for a couple of days, and then we were going to spend some time, just the two of us, and it was great. And then I was diagnosed with cancer and had to start cancer treatment, and that trip was off. Oh, boy. So we rescheduled. We came around now to the, the, the trip. We rescheduled the trip with uh, Michael and Carissa. We're going to go to that. We came within two days of going on that trip, and Carissa and the boys all got sick, and they pulled the plug on the trip. And so we eventually actually were able to make that one, but as a result of all this moving around, we ended up with tickets to go to Maui, uh, to Hawaii that we had to use by October of this year. And we said, you know what would be fun? Celebrating the end of cancer treatments by going to Hawaii. So we planned a trip to Maui. <laughs> Guess what happened? It burned down. It's like, are you kidding me? Cancer, pregnancy, sickness, fires, all happening. We don't control any of it. We have no control over any of those things then we are going to go, not to Maui. But my point is, look at all these things that can happen and did happen that just upset our plans. We don't control very much in this world. And if we think our peace is dependent upon our ability to control, we're in a world of hurt. We'll never be at peace. Uh, we need a peace that is there when everything's falling apart. They can be there when nothing's going the way we want. That's the peace we want. Now, um, we often think of peace as kind of the absence of some things. Like um, peace is the absence of fear and stress and anxiety and conflict. If we have those, we'll be at peace. Jesus says, I'm going to give you peace that is a tangible thing, a force in your life that can bring, give you hearts that are settled and calm that's the peace that I'm going to give you. It's not like the world's peace. It's a real thing that can be active in your life. It's a force that can rule your hearts and be there even when everything around you is troubled. There's a really cool thing. There's a, there's a passage in the book of Colossians that we need to pay attention to. It's in Colossians 3.15. It says this, Let the peace of Christ Rule in your hearts, since as members of one, one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. So here's the thing. Uh, he didn't say, let the peace of Christ come into your hearts. Why? Well, because in Christ, you, when you trust in Christ, you get his peace. It's already there. So now what do you have to do? He said, now you have to let it rule. Uh, Greek word translated rule there means to decide or to act as umpire. Interesting. Watched uh, a lot of baseball games this year, very disappointed by the Padres. I uh, thought they were going to be great, and they're not. Um, and I've, one of the things I've been frustrated by is how many times I watch a game, and it's like the umpire is calling pitches that are way out of the strike zone, he's calling them a strike. And I, I'll yell at him, that's not a strike! Here's the deal. If the umpire says it's a strike, it's a strike. I found that out when I was a freshman in college. I actually kind of found it out before that, but I had this one moment my freshman year in college that really brought it into very clear focus. Um, I was a scrub, not getting to play much, you know, and the only time I ever got in a game was when it was a blowout. So one day we had this game where it was great because after five innings, we were losing 12 to nothing. I thought, great, I'm going to get to play today. You know? Sure enough, coach puts me in right at the end of the game. I get one at bat. We're down 12 to nothing. It's the, bottom, it's the uh, top of the ninth inning, and there are two outs and nobody on base, and I get my one at bat. Well, this is a time where it's like, well, the, this doesn't mean anything, but it means a lot to me because I got a chance to show the coach what I can do. And so, you know, I worked the count and got to about a two-ball, two-strike count. And the pitcher threw this pitch that was, you know, threatening to kill worms. It was so low. You know, it just, I mean, it barely didn't hit the plate. It was way low. 
way out of the strike zone. I let that go by. I thought, well, that's ball three. And the umpire goes, strike three, you're out, game is over. And I, I turn around and I said, what? Are you kidding me? That wasn't even close. And the umpire took his mask off. He looks at me and he said, this game is way out of hand. It's late. I want to go home. <laughs> Literally said, I didn't want to go home. So you're out. And here's the problem. It, it, that was not a strike, except the umpire said it was a strike. So it was a strike. There went my chance. I struck out. That's it. Too bad. The umpire decides. Let the peace of Christ be the umpire in your life. That's what Paul was telling us. It's the peace of Christ is there. He's the Prince of Peace. He's in your life. He comes, he brings peace. He's called the, the God of peace, the spirit of peace in your life. What do we have to do? We have to let his peace rule, meaning we have to trust when he says, you have peace with God the Father now because of what I have done for you. And there is no condemnation for you. We have to believe that. We have to say, okay, that is the truth. Sometimes I don't feel like that because I'm such a mess. How could God love me? How could God from eh, eh, eh. You have peace with God. Peace of Christ rules, done deal. I'm good with God because of what Jesus says and what Jesus has done. We have peace with ourselves. Boy, a lot of times I think, oh, man, I'm, I wish I was so much, you know, more than what I am. And I'm such a failure. I'm so you know, I'm down on myself. And God comes along and says, I love you and nothing will ever separate me from your love. Christ says, you're going to let the, what he says decide or what you say. He says, you have infinite worth, enough that I would give my own son for you. Jesus says, I will die on a cross for you to have you as my, part of my family. Because you matter that much to me. The world doesn't care about my worth. It thinks I'm worth little or nothing. Which matters? What the world says, what I say, or am I going to let the peace of Christ rule? We get stressed about circumstances because, wow, I want this. I want this is what's best for me. And uh, God says, well, actually, we're going to do something else. Am I going to be at peace? Because he says, I'm working for the best for you. Let my peace rule in your circumstances. Or are we going to stress because we're not getting what we want? There's a little key to that peace at the very end of Colossians 3.15. Just three words. And be thankful. A key to letting the peace of Christ rule in our lives is being thankful in every situation, saying, God, I thank you that I can trust you. I thank you you love me. I thank you that I'm forgiven. I'm thank, thankful that you have a plan for me. I don't understand the plan always. Uh, I'd rather not have had to be going to cancer centers and do all of that. But you know what? God, you have a plan. I'm trusting in that plan. As we let the peace of Christ rule, that's when we begin to experience true peace. So, you know... Uh, our son Toby is an emergency medicine physician working at uh, the emergency department at Palomar Hospital. He works pretty much exclusively uh, nights uh, because he says he likes being there when the hospital administrators aren't there. <laughs> but uh, he, you know, um, he, what he does, his job is literally a matter of life and death. I mean, you know, we talk to him and we hear about the stories that he has. And some, sometimes, what he deals with is not dire. It's just like, you know, he had recently had one where this little little toddler came in. Toddler had fallen and hit his head the corner of a table and laid it open to the scalp. And Toby had to stitch it all up, you know, put the little boy back together. And I don't know how you do that. He did it. But some nights it's dire. He had one recently where three cardiac arrests in his shift. One of them, the guy died multiple times, and they kept bringing him back. You know, his life was in my son's hands. Um, he says that generally things in the uh, emergency department, this is something that Mark has verified for me, are hectic. Uh, that's the good end of it. The bad end of it is total chaos. And he has said uh, one of the keys to being a good job, being a good emergency physician is managing the chaos. And it occurred to me, 
that's pretty much true for all of us, isn't it? Life is about managing the chaos. Lori likes to say, embrace the chaos, you know? Um, this is what peace is all about. It's not about having peaceful circumstances, getting what we want. We would like that. It would be wonderful if we had that. But the truth is, life is chaotic, unpredictable. And for us to get through it all, it's going to be about managing the chaos. Well, how do we do that? We don't have the power to control it. So what we do is we trust God. His plan, His love, His way, His goodness, His peace in our lives. In his book, Ruthless Trust, the late Brennan Manning told about a conversation he had with the most brilliant student he ever had. It was a man named Augustus Gordon. And at one point in the conversation, Manning asked him, could you sum up the Christian life in one sentence? And um, Gordon said, I can sum up the Christian life in one word, trust. The supreme need in most of our lives is often the most overlooked, namely the need for uncompromising trust in the love of God. To trust means to let God do it his way. Be confident that he is good, he is loving, he is faithful, he is powerful, and he is really there and really at work in our lives. It's hard sometimes, but the way to peace is trusting him at all times in everything and giving thanks. Let's pray. Father, we're, um, as you know, we read, don't let your hearts be troubled. We kind of tend to be like the disciples say, oh, too late. Um, our hearts often are anxious and stressed, and you know that, Lord. And this is a great reminder to us that, that we know we all want peace. I mean, to be at peace is just wonderful. To be able to just be secure in life and go through life completely at peace, we, we all long for that. You know that, Lord. And this is great news to us that that's possible because of what you've done for us in Jesus. Help us, Lord, to let the peace of Christ that's in our lives through the presence of the Spirit of Jesus in us be the umpire in our lives to decide. Help us to give thanks to you in all things and to trust you so that we can be at peace. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So we're going to sing from the insert in your song sheet, and we are going to sing about standing in God's love. And you can stand. Yes. One, one, two, three, four, we go.
we pray you have a great week and let God's peace rule in your hearts. It'll set you free. Thanks for being here. It's great seeing you, and we love you guys. Okay. One, two, my favorite.